नमस्कार दिस इज फर्स्ट पोस्ट इन यू वॉचिंग वैंटेज विद मी पलकी शर्मा Iran is flexing its military muscle it's issuing threats to Israel and warning the western powers that uh Israel may be trying to uh, to trap them Israel is still figuring out its next response trying to build diplomatic pressure as the divided war cabinet cancels a meeting for the second time in 2 days and the prime minister continues to lose popularity and public confidence Also economic experts are issuing dire projections of what an Iran Israel war would mean for the global economy. We'll bring you all of it. On the other side of the world, Solomon Islands voted today. It was basically a referendum on China. We'll tell you why the world was watching it closely. In India, the Congress party has hit out at the country's envoy to Ireland for a letter that he wrote in a newspaper. We'll explain why. In Vietnam, the government secretly gave some 24 billion dollars to a bank caught in the country's biggest scam. In Georgia, growing protest over a foreign agent's bill. In Dubai, record rainfall and floods. What caused it in the middle of a desert? How Nestle has been called out for adding sugar to baby food in global south countries and why a couple in Gujarat gave up all their wealth, 23 million dollars of it, to become monks. All this and more coming up the headlines first. The defense chiefs of the United States and China hold talks for the first time in nearly 18 months. The two countries discuss Taiwan and tensions in the South China Sea. Recently, there have been frequent clashes in the disputed waters between China the, and and the US ally, the Philippines. Russian peacekeepers begin withdrawing from Nagorno-Karabakh. Last year, Azerbaijan had captured the disputed territory from Armenian separatists. In 2020, Russia deployed its troops there. as part of the moscow brokered ceasefire between baku and yerevan in india campaigning ends for the first phase of the general election 101 constituencies will vote on friday west bengal chief mamata banerjee releases her party's manifesto promising to scrap the citizenship law if the india bloc comes to power businesses closed in cities across uganda this is in protest over high taxes and a newly enforced revenue collection system the strike started on tuesday butchers bankers butchers bakers and eateries have all joined the protest and a pakistani high court orders the government to restore x within a week in february imran khan's party had called for protest since then x has been almost inaccessible in pakistan it was revealed in court that the interior ministry had ordered to shut down the site the clock is ticking for west asia all eyes are on benjamin netanyahu when will he hit iran and how will he hit back These two questions will define the region's immediate future. Iran is hoping it doesn't come to that. They held a military parade near Tehran today. President Ibrahim Raisi presided over it. All sorts of Iranian weapons were on display: long-range ballistic missiles, drones and rockets. The idea of this parade was quite simple: to flex Iran's military muscle, to tell Israel, "Do not think about attacking us." President Raisi said as much in his speech he threatened a severe response if Israel attacked If the Zionist regime makes the slightest move to violate our territory and harm the national interests of the Islamic Republic they must understand that they will face a severe and heavy response That threat may not deter Israel all indications are they will hit back So Iran is also using a second strategy, asking western nations to build pressure. The top diplomat in London is on the job. Listen to his latest statements. This is a good opportunity for western countries to demonstrate that they are rational actors and they are not going to be entrapped by Netanyahu and his goal, which is to be in power for as long as he could actually stay in power. This is a more viable strategy. The West has the best chance of changing Netanyahu's mind because they have leverage. We saw that over the weekend. The US and the UK shot down dozens of Iranian drones. 
They gave Israel billions in military aid. So the West can pull some strings. Their foreign ministers are visiting Israel. Britain's Foreign Secretary David Cameron is in the country, so is the German Foreign Minister Anna Baerbock. Both of them met their Israeli counterpart. They also held talks with the Israeli president. Now, Cameron had an interesting assessment. He said it's clear that Israel is going to strike. So he wants that strike to be limited. Uh, it's right to have made our views clear about what should happen next, but it's clear the Israelis are making a decision to act. We hope they do so in a way that does as little to escalate this uh, as possible, and in a way that, as I said yesterday, is, is smart as well as tough. And he's right. Israel is preparing the ground for an attack. Their foreign minister is reaching out for support. He's written letters to 32 countries. He's also spoken to dozens of counterparts. And what is he telling them? Two things. To sanction Iran's nuclear program and to designate the Iranian guards as terrorists. So the diplomatic campaign is already underway. The second is the propaganda. On Tuesday, Israel decided to hold a photo op. They displayed an Iranian ballistic missile shot down by Israel. It was apparently retrieved from the Dead Sea. Now just look at the size of that missile. When you see that, what is the first thought that crosses your mind? How lucky Israel is, how deadly Iran's attack could have been. It's a strategy to rally global opinion, to build support for a counter-strike, which brings us back to Israel's Western allies. Can they nudge Israel towards a less risky attack? One that does not lead to escalation. For that, they must offer Israel something, and that something could be sanctions. Iran's economy is already crippled by Western sanctions. Now the West is preparing more of it. We will increase our outreach with the key partners in the region. And some member states propose the adoption of uh, uh, expand the restrictive measures against Iran. Um, with respect to sanctions, I fully expect that we will take additional sanctions action against Iran in the coming days. Both Europe and the U.S. are promising more sanctions, meaning more economic pain for Iran, and Netanyahu knows how important that is. Sanctions are the only thing keeping Iran's economy in check. Without them, its coffers would be flush with oil money. And where will that money be spent? On more defense. So sanctions are a key Western deterrent. They may not avert an Israeli strike, but they could limit the scale of it. U.S. officials are cautiously confident about this. They think Israel will not attack Iranian soil. Instead, they could hit Iranian proxies, like the Hezbollah in Lebanon or the Houthis in Yemen. It all depends on Israel's war cabinet. It was supposed to meet for a third time on Tuesday, but that meeting was put off, and so far it has not been convened today either. Some hardliners in the cabinet want a tough response. Some moderates urge restraint. I guess the final call will be Netanyahu's. So Israel's war cabinet is divided. But what about the people of Israel? Do they want to go to war with Iran? Turns out they find the idea too risky. A new poll is out and this is what it says. 74% people do not want an attack if it hurts Israel's security alliances. Only 26% Israelis support an attack on Iran. They support the idea of striking Iran even if it strains Israel's relations with allies. So the prevailing public opinion is against military action. I really hope it won't be a big war now. None of us in Israel want a big war. Um, so I hope that's it. Well, yeah, we're very upset. We didn't want the war with Hamas. They attacked us. We don't want the war with Iran. They attack us. They sound tired of the war, and who can blame them? Israel has been caught in an endless spiral of violence, and there seems to be no exit strategy. Israel's military action began as a response to the October 7 attacks. But today, Israeli forces are fighting on three fronts. There is the ongoing battle with Hamas in Gaza. In the north, Israel is clashing with the Hezbollah. And now there is an emerging front with Iran. When a country goes to war, most citizens rally around their leader. But Israel's leader is deeply unpopular at home. So despite the war, or perhaps because of it, we've seen repeated protests. The latest instance was last Saturday, just before Iran's military and drone attacks. This is what the streets of Israel looked like, with thousands of people rallying against their prime minister. We've been saying for
for a long time that our Prime Minister cannot be trusted and evidence has accumulated and are now cluttering and our country is near the abyss. I come here to a demonstration against the Prime Minister, Mr. Bibi Netanyahu. We want to change, we want to keep our democracy. He became a dictator and we didn't want dictatorship. Posters have sprung up across Israel. Some of them openly abuse and insult Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. He seems to have become public enemy number one. Support for his war has hit rock bottom. Over 70% of the Israelis want him to resign. There are three reasons driving the sentiment. The first one is linked to the October 7th attack. It was a big intelligence failure. But Netanyahu refuses to take responsibility for it. Although a lot of Israelis see it as his failure, this includes supporters of Netanyahu's Likud party. Last year, they were asked about this in a survey. 69% of them said that Netanyahu should take responsibility for October 7. And these are his party supporters. Reason number two is the status of the hostages. When Netanyahu declared war on Gaza, one of his big goals was to bring back the Israeli hostages taken by Hamas. More than 250 of them were taken on October 7. It's been six months of fighting. And still, about 130 hostages remain unaccounted for. At least 30 Israelis are presumed dead, 34. The families of these victims have been demanding answers, and they haven't got any. We need more effort. We actually need to do more things in order to release them, because apparently what we're doing is not enough. Reason number three is perception. How is Netanyahu viewed by the voters? Many Israelis feel that he's selfish. That's the finding of a recent study. It was published by uh, a university in Jerusalem. From October 2023 to January this year, they gathered the opinions of voters at various points in time. They asked them about Netanyahu's war and the decisions that he's taken as prime minister. And look at what they found. 56% of the respondents said Netanyahu's decisions were driven by political considerations, not national interest. And that is telling. So public support and confidence in the prime minister is shrinking, but he appears unfazed by these opinions, at least publicly. He has no intentions of stepping down. Also, he has shown no inclination to de-escalate tensions with Iran or to end the war in Gaza. And there is no strong political opposition against him. Yes, Netanyahu governs a fragile coalition. Yes, his government may fall even if one ally pulls out. But there is no significant campaign to oust him and no compelling alternative, really. What does this mean for Israel? It means that peace may continue to elude them for now. They should brace for unrest, both on the borders and within. Israel's ally, the United States, is also feeling uneasy. America's Treasury Secretary is worried. Her name is Janet Yellen. She is troubled by the situation in West Asia. She believes a surge in violence could impact the global economy. Listen to this. From this weekend's attacks, to the Houthi attacks in the Red Sea, Iran's actions threaten the region's stability and could cause economic spillovers. Look at the choice of words. Iran's actions threaten the region's stability. What about Israel's airstrike in Syria? Conveniently, Yellen made no mention of it. She paints Iran and its proxies as a problem, but overlooks the Israeli strike that set off the latest tensions. But that's American politics for you. Irrespective of who they blame, they're right when they say that this will have economic spillovers. Economists at the IMF are also nervous. That's the International Monetary Fund, IMF. They're concerned about the fluctuation in oil prices. What has been happening with the tensions in the Middle East is there's been some increase in oil prices, but it's too early to say whether that will be sustained. In the event of a wider war in West Asia, the conflict's biggest casualty will be the oil supplies from the region. They're the they are crucial, in fact, for the global economy, and the IMF is highlighting the risks here. A shortage of oil may make inflation worse and economies weaker. Countries like South Korea are preparing for the worst-case scenario. Their president, Yoon Soo Kyol, says he wants to mitigate the fallout of a wider conflict. 
Our country's dependence on crude oil from Middle East is 72%. This will directly lead to significant increases in transport costs and international oil price and will cause even greater pain to the people. And Seoul is not alone. Countries like India also rely on oil imports. India imports 85% of the oil it uses. Almost half of it comes from West Asia. It travels via the Strait of Hormuz. All major oil importers want this strait to remain open. Let me show you what I'm talking about, which region. The Strait of Hormuz lies between Iran and Oman. It is essential for the world's oil supplies. Over 17 million barrels of oil move through here every day. 17 million barrels every day. That's one-sixth of the world's oil. It travels through this waterway. It's a narrow passage. It looks like an inverted V. Now, the Strait of Hormuz connects the Persian Gulf to the Indian Ocean. If Israel goes to war with Iran, this route could be compromised. At least four major oil producers will be impacted. That's Saudi Arabia, Iran, the UAE and Kuwait. Most of their oil travels th through this strait. And these four countries are also among the world's biggest suppliers. If they are unable to access the Strait of Hormuz, if their exports are restricted, there would be chaos in the oil market. The world's energy supply could be choked. The one we describe in detail in our report is one where you would have uh, fairly significant uh, disruptions in oil markets that would lead to a 15% increase in oil prices and also uh, increase in, uh, in shipping costs. So that would be the first fallout. The second fallout will be seen in the global stock market. What do most investors dread? Uncertainty. They're always looking to avoid sudden shocks, events which could shrink their portfolios. So conflict could trigger a sell-off in the global stock markets with investors pulling their money and picking safer options. In fact, this could already be happening. In the past week, investors have sold over $15 billion worth of American stocks. These were shares of the biggest U.S. companies, commonly known as large cap stocks. A West Asian conflict could make global markets more volatile. So those are the two big risks. Depleted oil supplies and disruption in the stock markets. And the Indian economy is vulnerable on both these fronts. A disruption in the global oil market would mean a disruption in Indian supplies and a jump in prices. What about the stock markets? A conflict could impact key industries like automobiles, transport, aviation, paints, tires, cement, chemicals. All these sectors could take a hit. Since 2020, our world has endured three big shocks. The Wuhan virus pandemic and two major wars, Ukraine and Gaza. The last thing we need is another setback. But if Israel refuses to reverse course, it may be inevitable. Our next story is from the other side of the world, from an island nation in the Pacific Ocean, the Solomon Islands. The Solomon Islands went to polls today, but this election was a bit unusual because it wasn't just about local politics, it was also a vote on China. For the past five years, China has been making inroads in the Solomon Islands. Beijing has an ally in the incumbent prime minister, Manasseh Sogaware. He signed a secret security pact with China in the year 2022. The people of the Solomons have not been told of the details of this pact. And some are wary about Beijing's growing influence, which is why today's polls are almost a referendum on China. And the country is doing everything to ensure that the results go Beijing's way. Here's our report. These are the Solomon Islands, a nation in the Pacific Ocean, made up of six major islands and more than 900 smaller ones. These islands are home to about 700,000 people, and more than half of them were eligible to vote today. The Solomon Islands held their parliamentary election earlier in the day. People were lining up as early as 4 a.m. in some places, waiting for the polling booths to open at 7 and cast a vote that could reshape the geopolitical landscape of the Pacific. Because these elections aren't just about the Solomon Islands, they are also a referendum on China. We have civil ties with Taiwan, and now we, we have diplomatic ties with China. Um, I think for me, I was hoping that that would bring good change for this country, but, but I've yet to see that happen. To happen. In 2019, the Solomon Islands withdrew their recognition of Taiwan. Instead, they decided to open ties with China. 
This was done under the incumbent Prime Minister, Manasseh Sogavari. Sogavari has spent most of the last five years bringing his country closer to China. And Beijing has rewarded him with funds in the form of both gifts and investments. China built a stadium for Sogavari at the cost of about $119 million. Beijing called it a gift with no strings attached. But this is China. A price had already been extracted in the form of a clandestine security deal. The deal was inked in 2022, but no one is sure about what it entails. So Gavre has kept the details hidden from the public. As Central Moon Islander, uh, I feel that it's not that really okay. The fact that uh, I think the whole population didn't know what actually is in that security pack deal. So I think the, if we know more about uh, what's in the uh, security pack deal, then there I should uh, say that I will put my uh, clear view or opinion on whether it's good for Solomon Islanders or not. That is why this election is being seen as a referendum on China. The Solomon Islands were traditionally close to the West, especially neighbouring Australia. But the pivot to China has put the islands at the centre of a geopolitical Cold War. The West is worried that China will use the Solomon Islands to get a foothold in the Pacific and that they will do anything to keep their ally Sogavari in power. This includes meddling in the elections, which Beijing already seems to be doing. Take a look at these Facebook posts from the Chinese embassy in the Solomon Islands. Less than a week ago, they were giving away computers, solar-powered lights and fishing nets. Four days ago, they donated money to renovate a school hall. They also announced a new broadband infrastructure project, all on the eve of elections. It's brazen election interference. And then China says this. China has been upholding the principle of non-interference in the internal affairs of other countries. We support the people of the Solomon Islands in choosing the development path in line with their national condition independently. China has been backing Sogavre's re-election bid. He has promised to deepen his ties with Beijing if he returns to power. Will Solomon Islanders allow this? Will they let Beijing get a tighter grip on their nation? We'll find out when the results come out in a few days. We are days away from voting in India, so there's a political pundit in every corner. Everyone has something to say about the candidates, about the election strategy and about who will win the election. But can Indian civil servants do the same? I'm talking about your bureaucrats and diplomats. Can they also openly talk politics? I ask because it's become quite the controversy. It all started with an article in the Irish Times, your typical Western hit piece. Look at one of the many sweeping statements in it. This is what it says. India's democratic credentials have been severely tarnished. So naturally, there was pushback, and it came from India's ambassador to Ireland. His name is Akhilesh Mishra. The ambassador wrote a letter to the newspaper, which is quite common. Foreign ambassadors do write op-eds and articles, even the ones posted in India, they write all the time. But his words have triggered a controversy. His critics say he crossed a line. Let me quote from what he wrote. The fight against the deeply entrenched ecosystem of corruption created by the 55-year rule including first 30 years by a single dynastic party in India, is a major factor behind Mr. Modi's ever-growing popularity. If you follow Indian politics, you do not need an explanation. If not, let me tell you what this is about. Only one party has ruled India for 55 years. That's the Congress party, India's main opposition. After independence, they have mostly been led by members of one family, that is the Nehru Gandhi family. So critics are quick to raise that. They call the Congress a dynastic political party. So has India's ambassador to Ireland. He's done the same. In fact, he's gone a step ahead. He has blamed the Congress for corruption in India, and he's entitled to his opinion. But can he express it on such a platform? That has become a subject of debate. Politicians do it all the time. So do political commentators. But diplomats tend to steer clear of this. So the Congress party has taken up the matter. They say Ambassador Mishra should, should not have made those remarks. Let me quote from their statement, the Congress party statement. Defending the government of India is one thing and is to be expected. But to attack opposition parties openly in this manner is not expected from an ambassador. This is unprofessional and disgraceful, 
disgraceful behavior, he should be sacked right away. Now, India's Foreign Service is professional. There are very few political appointees. Even the Irish envoy is a career diplomat. So he's bound by service rules. And what do they say? They say you cannot show political and ideological inclination. Now, the question is, did these comments violate those rules? We read the ambassador's whole article, and later on he makes uh, some points worth noting too. He says, Indian Hindus are not a monolithic vote bank. He also points out that the BJP only rules in 12 out of 28 states. Both are strong arguments for Indian democracy, but chances are no one will focus on that because his earlier lines are seen as problematic. Now, this episode also raises a larger question. What role do diplomats play in domestic politics? Well, it depends on which country you're looking at. In the US, the Foreign Service is all political. Many ambassadors are active politicians, like the US ambassador to India. His name is Eric Garcetti. He's a former mayor of Los Angeles. Now, Garcetti is a bona fide politician. He's a member of Joe Biden's Democratic Party. And it's actually quite common in the US. Some ambassadors have gone on to become presidents there, like John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, and George H.W. Bush. But India's system is quite different. Most Indian ambassadors are members of the IFS, the Indian Foreign Service, and political appointees are quite few. For most of the last century, there was an unwritten rule. Only six ambassadors should be political appointees. The rest should be career diplomats. But now that number is changing. Of course, after retirement, you're free to join politics. In fact, the IFS has given India a number of ministers, like Natwar Singh in the 2000s and S. J. Shankar today. Diplomats certainly have the skill and the worldview to be politicians, but when they dabble in politics is the crucial question. Our next story is from Vietnam. It's about the scam that rocked the nation, the biggest financial fraud in Southeast Asia's history. It involves a real estate tycoon. Her name is Truong Mai Lan. She's been convicted of embezzling $12.5 billion, and Vietnam has given her the death penalty. We've covered this case on the show before. But here's a refresher. Lan was the chair of VTP Holdings, one of Vietnam's biggest real estate companies. They developed high-end properties, like your luxury hotels and apartments and even shopping malls. Most of these are in prime locations, like downtown Ho Chi Minh City, which is Vietnam's financial hub. Lan founded the VTP Group in 1992, and she'd been expanding the business ever since. So how did this real estate tycoon steal billions of dollars? She did it through a bank that she owned the Saigon Joint Stock Commercial Bank, or SCB. This bank was founded in the year 2012 through the merger of three smaller banks. And Lan oversaw this merger. And she walked away with a part of the bank, SCB. She took a part of that. How much? Almost 90%. Now, you may wonder how this was allowed. Doesn't Vietnam have laws to prevent this sort of thing? Well, they do. So Lan did not officially own that much herself. She owned this bank through proxies, 90% of it. She owned it through proxies, and they helped her indirectly control 90% of SCB. So we have a real estate tycoon who now owns a bank, one of the biggest banks in Vietnam, holding billions in customer deposits. What do you imagine happened? She started giving loans to herself, again, indirectly. She got the SCB to issue loans to shadow companies, and those loans eventually found their way to her pocket. She embezzled $12.5 billion in this manner. That's not all, though. Lan also used the bank for other scams. She duped ordinary bank depositors into buying her company's bonds. They thought they were just depositing their money in the bank. Instead, their money got tied up with Lan's VTP group and its proxies. When I deposited money there at the SCB bank, 
The bank staff member did not use the word bond. I had to complete several forms and could only get the results some days later. During those days, they only gave me a paper saying that they had received that much money from me. Then I had to wait for approval before receiving the receipt. Eventually, the Vietnamese authorities caught on. They arrested Lan in October 2022, but that led to another problem. Everyone knew that Lan controlled SCB. So depositors panicked when they heard about her arrest. And it started what's known as a bank run. That's when everyone rushes to withdraw their deposits from banks. That's a bank run. Now, the bank did not have all the money required to pay back customers because it had given billions to Lan and her company. This put thousands of ordinary people at risk. People who'd done nothing wrong. They just put their money in the wrong bank. To avoid a disaster, Vietnam's central bank took over the SCB. This was in October 2022, and that was immediately after Lan's arrest. The SCB was put under, quote-unquote, special scrutiny. What does that mean? Well, we got the answer today. Vietnam's government took over the bank in October 2022, and since then it has secretly poured billions into the bank, almost $24 billion over the last year and a half. Vietnam did this to protect depositors. The SCB is technically borrowing money from Vietnam's government and using it to pay back innocent depositors. When the Vietnam government took over the SCB, it gave the bank about $3.7 billion a month, both in October and November 2022, and since then it has been sending the bank about a billion dollars a month. If you add all of this, it comes to almost $24 billion. That is close to 6% of Vietnam's annual economic output or a quarter of the country's foreign exchange reserves. It's a massive sum of money, and Vietnam's government secretly gave this to the embattled bank. There was no public announcement, no information to the taxpayer, just a silent rescue operation. I leave it up to you to decide if this was the right move. And now Vietnam's reaction to the scam makes more sense. Lands was the most high-profile corruption trial in Vietnam's history, and it ended with her being given the death penalty. It won't bring back the billions that Vietnam's government has lost, but they still want her to pay with her life. For our next story, let's talk about Georgia. It's a Black Sea nation, nestled between Russia, Turkey, Ar Armenia and Azerbaijan. It has a population of 3.7 million people, and it is at a crossroads. This is over a new foreign agents bill. The ruling party wants to pass the bill. The opposition has compared it to Russian laws. The West has slammed it, and there are huge protests. Many believe it could derail Georgia's European ambitions. Then why does the ruling party want to pass this bill? What is the foreign agents bill, and do other countries have such laws? Our next report tells you. <laughs> Mass street protests, brawls in parliament, yet nothing could stop this bill. The controversial foreign agents law has gotten its first green light. 83 Georgian Dream Party MPs have backed it. That's the ruling party. However, the opposition boycotted the vote. So why is this bill so controversial? It's called the Law on Transparency of Foreign Influence. It requires NGOs and media organizations to reveal their funding. If they receive 20% of their funding from abroad, they must register as agents of foreign influence. If they don't obey, they will face hefty fines. Georgia's ruling party tried to introduce it in March last year. It led to two nights of violent protests, so the party backed down. Now they've brought it back. So why does the ruling party promote this bill? It says it's modelled on a US law. The party says it'll promote transparency. It wants to combat pseudo-liberal values imposed by foreigners. Georgia's opposition, however, calls it the Russian law. It says it's similar to laws used by the Kremlin to quell dissent. There are also concerns about Tbilisi's future. Many believe this could derail its European dream. And that's led to massive protests. As many as 10,000 protesters gathered outside the parliament. They clashed with the police. Hundreds were arrested. This is really an existential choice. It's a situation 
Uh, it's a point of no return, really. Uh, I would compare this law to a new iron curtain. Some would compare it to a new new wall between Georgia and the EU. This law brings uh, the discreditation of the Georgian media and Georgian civil society, uh, which are the core instruments of uh, the Georgian democracy. Georgia's law isn't the first of its kind. Other countries have similar laws. The first is the U.S. FARA, or the Foreign Agents Registration Act. Organizations that receive foreign funding must register under the FARA. Then there's India. It has the Foreign Contribution Regulation Act. Any organization that intends to receive foreign donations must register under this act. This includes associations, groups and NGOs. There's also Russia. It has a very strict foreign agents law. Any individual or organization that receives foreign support must register. They will be declared foreign agents. Georgia's opposition has compared the new bill to this law. Hungary and Israel also have such transparency laws, so Georgia isn't the first by a long shot. The bill still has two more readings. Then it needs votes to pass. And finally, it faces a presidential veto. So there's still time before it becomes a reality. But the bill puts the country at a crossroads. For a long time, it has deepened its relationships with the West, due to the unpopular Soviet sentiment in the country. But the recent ruling party is accused of steering it towards Russia. This turmoil comes ahead of elections in October, elections that will decide Georgia's future. Will it court the West again, or will it be back in Moscow's orbit? Our next story is about a global giant, a giant that only seems to care about the West. I'm talking about Nestle, the biggest consumer goods company in the world. And what have they done? Possibly risk the health of babies in the global South. Let me explain. A big chunk of Nestle's business is baby food, like infant cereals and formula or baby milk powder. Now in the West, these products follow global guidelines. No added sugar, no honey, no sucrose. Basically nothing sweet. But in the global South, that is not the case. A Swiss organization tested Nestle products sold in the global South, mostly in Asia, Africa and Latin America. And what did they find? Most of them had added sugar. We are talking about products for babies and toddlers under three years of age. In Africa, a flavored cereal had six grams of added sugar. The same product in Switzerland had none. Another cereal sold in India had 2.7 grams of sugar. In Brazil, six out of eight Nestle products had sugar. How much? Four grams per serving. In Nigeria, one product had 6.8 grams of added sugar. Now I know you have questions and we will try to answer the two basic ones first. First of all, why is added sugar bad? And question number two, why is Nestle doing it? It's bad because sugar leads to multiple health issues like childhood obesity, cardiovascular disease and tooth decay. And no, it is not a rich man's problem. Obesity is rising in low and middle income countries. Africa makes up 24% of the world's overweight children. Africa. So added sugar is not good for kids anywhere in the world. Most Western governments have guidelines for this. They say do not add extra sugar to baby food. But many countries in the Global South do not, like India and Bangladesh. Which brings us to the second question. Why is Nestle doing it? Because it keeps the children hooked. More sugar equals more taste. More taste equals more consumption. And more consumption equals more sales. But look at the double standard here. In the West, Nestle is happy to obey the rules, even if it means less sales. But in the Global South, they're using a loophole. Nestle knows that added sugar is a problem. But they also know that there are, there are no strict rules, so technically it's not illegal. But why this different attitude? If Nestle can remove sugar in the West, why not elsewhere? Well, the company says it follows local regulations. It says recipes depend on multiple factors like local rules and availability of ingredients. So nothing unlawful is happening. But I'm afraid it won't cut it. We're not talking about some reeling startup here. This is Nestle. They own more than 2,000 brands in 180 countries. Their global sales is more than $100 billion. If Nestle can't do it, who can? 
So governments need to take note. You can't depend on foreign organizations to call out such products. You must strengthen your own regulators. Carry out periodic tests, increase awareness and enforce global health guidelines because one thing is clear, you cannot trust multinationals to protect us. Just look at the health sector. You would think that at least medicines would be safe. Well, think again. Around 10% of all medical products in low and middle income countries are substandard. A United Nations report blamed such drugs for 500,000 deaths in sub-Saharan Africa. Let that sink in. 500,000, 5 lakh deaths per year due to substandard drugs. Consumer products have the same problem, like soft drinks. In 2007, Pepsi and Coca-Cola found themselves in trouble. An Indian study found that both drinks had high traces of pesticide. It was 30 times what was found in the US and European markets. So many Indian states actually banned these sodas. Another case was Nestle's Maggie noodles. Indian labs found it had high traces of lead, much more than the permissible amount. It actually led to a nationwide ban of the product in 2015. Recently, we've seen substandard syrups. The latest is in Africa. Regulators in six countries have recalled a batch of Johnson & Johnson syrup. Labs found it had high levels of toxicity. Have you wondered why these cases only happen in the global south? Yes, weak regulation is a problem, but so is attitude. Multinationals are willing to gamble on lives in the global south. They think they can get away with it. Not every country can splurge millions on inspections and regulations. But those countries also deserve safe products. The U.S. Food and Drug Regulator has a massive budget, more than $7 billion. But how many countries can afford that? Maybe a handful. So it's important for global bodies to step up, to hold big companies accountable. If not, the likes of Nestle will never course correct. Our next story is about Dubai. It's flooded. The desert kingdom receives sparse rainfall every year, but yesterday was quite different. It was the wettest day in Dubai's history. So much so that the city received a year's worth of rainfall in a single day. It paralyzed the whole of Dubai. Highways and malls were flooded, flight operations were suspended, schools were closed, and at least one person was killed. So what led to this torrential rainfall in Dubai of all places? Is it climate change or something else? Our next report tells you. Luxurious skyscrapers, desert landscapes, and world-class infrastructure. Dubai is known for a lot, but if there's one thing it's not known for, it's rain. Well, not anymore. The desert kingdom is flooded. Roads turned into rivers. Flights were cancelled. Jets looked like jumbo boats. Waters rushed into luxury malls. Homes were inundated. At least one person was killed. On Tuesday, Dubai received around 142 millimetres of rainfall. It hit the city in just 24 hours. This is the amount of rainfall that Dubai receives in a whole year. Scientists say it was the highest rainfall since records began in 1949. That's even before the formation of the UAE in 1971. So it led to rampant flash flooding. The rain fell so heavily that roads were inoperable in just moments. Schools were shut, residents worked from home, and tankers tried to pump out water from the streets. But it didn't help much. You see, Dubai is a city built in the middle of a desert. It has a hot and dry climate. Rain is rare. Even when it happens, it's sparse. <laughs> so Dubai doesn't have the infrastructure to deal with such torrential flooding. And it showed with the chaos at the Dubai airport. The flooding left limited transportation options. Aircraft crews couldn't reach the airfield. Several airlines suspended check-ins, leaving passengers stranded at the world's second busiest airport. So what led to this heavy rainfall in Dubai? The rain was part of a larger storm system. It's looming over the Arabian Peninsula. Dubai isn't the only affected city. Storms hit the whole of the UAE and Bahrain. Oman too is dealing with flash flooding. 
18 people were killed in the kingdom, including several children. Scientists are yet to work out the exact reason, but many believe it's global warming. With global warming, the earth is heating up. That way, it's soaking more moisture. That leads to frequent gushes of rainfall. Many have blamed Dubai's cloud seeding efforts for the latest floods, but there's no evidence to link it to that. The rains are likely to continue till Wednesday. After that, dry weather is set to return. But Dubai will reel for this for some time now. They say when it rains, it pours. And it turned out to be true for Dubai. Imagine if you had $23 million. What would you do with the money? Buy a luxurious home, go on a vacation, or invest for a better future? What are the chances that you'd give it all away? Would you renounce your wealth and become a monk? Sounds a bit far-fetched, doesn't it? But that's exactly what an Indian couple is doing. I'm talking about Bhavesh and Jeenal Bhandari from the Indian state of Gujarat. They belong to an affluent real estate business family. This week, they donated 200 crore rupees. 200 crores, that is 23 million US dollars. They donated it all and adopted monkhood meaning they will sever all family ties. They will only be allowed two white garments, a white broom to brush insects away, and a bowl for arms, which they will survive on. Now, this couple is getting a lot of attention, not so much for what they donated, as for how they donated it. They took out a procession spanning four kilometers. It was adorned, they were adorned in rich attire and jewelry. They stood atop a truck that looked more like a royal chariot. And as the procession went on, the couple tossed banknotes, garments, mobile phones, even air conditioners. And now they've gone viral, mostly for the wrong reasons. Some people called it an absurd show of wealth. Others said it was hypocrisy. And still others said, what's the need to adopt monkhood and then advertise it? So the reactions are brutal. But here's the context. The Bhandaris are members of the Jain faith. This is a small but ancient religion in India. It says that possessions are an obstacle to liberation in life. So Jainism follows the practice of Diksha, a ritual of renunciation. In order to do that, people hold what they called a Varshidan Yatra. This is the final step to monkhood, a symbolic gesture in the form of, a, of an all-out procession where people dispose of their worldly belongings. It is seen as a celebration, hence the joyous procession. So, so this couple was only following tradition and a very tough one at that. There are few who can do this because it's not just about the money. Accepting monkhood means losing your home, the clothes on your back and most importantly your family. You lose all of it. For instance, in 2017, an Indian couple renounced their wealth. They gave away 100 crore rupees or 11 million dollars. They too became monks. And with that, they renounced their three-year-old daughter as well. Even though there's support from within the Jain community for this practice, the decision drew a lot of backlash. What will happen to the child? Why must she suffer because the parents suddenly had a change of heart? As I said, it's a tough tradition, not for the faint-hearted. But clearly, this has nothing to do with one's age. Because even youngsters are embracing this practice, like an eight-year-old girl named Devanshi. She stood to inherit a multi-million dollar diamond fortune, but in 2023, she renounced all material comforts amid a grand procession with camels, elephants, and fanfare, which again led to a fiery debate. Why did her family allow this? In India, where children don't even decide their college stream before they're 16, a girl half that age took a life-changing decision. So why do people do this? What does it take to give away all your worldly possessions? For some, it's about their faith. Like the Bhandaris, their family is deeply connected to the teachings of Jainism. In 2022, their teenage children adopted monkhood. The couple says the decision was difficult, but they want to follow in the footsteps of their children. What about the others? Some say they're, dis they're disenchanted with the material world. Some can't take the pressures of modern life and to some renouncing wealth is the path to inner peace. And maybe it is the right choice, but it, it can also go very wrong. For instance, a Jain girl became an ascetic when she was nine, but when she turned 21, she eloped and married her boyfriend, which caused quite a scandal. So whether it is about faith or being highly impressionable, we can agree on one thing, listening to your inner voice is no easy task. 
And now it's time for Vantage Shots, images that tell the story. In India, solar rays illuminate the forehead of Lord Ram's idol at the Ayodhya temple on the occasion of Ram Navmi. In Australia, coral bleaching affects most of the Great Barrier Reef. And in New York, a giant plastic waste installation aims to highlight the importance of reusable containers. Finally, taking you back in history on this day in 1983, India launched the fourth and final flight of SLV-3 rocket. It was the country's first experimental satellite launch vehicle. It placed India's Rohini satellite into orbit. The launch highlighted India's arrival in the space race. We're leaving you on that note. Thanks for watching. We'll see you tomorrow. Thank you.